can I start? Uh, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the NCCR Automation Seminar Series. Uh, our speaker today is uh, Dr. Arash Adudani from uh, Italian Institute of Technology. Uh, thank you, Arash, for accepting our invitation. Uh, before uh, listening to your presentation, I would like to uh, introduce our speaker uh, a bit more. So uh, Arash is uh, currently a tenured senior scientist at the Italian Institute of Technology, uh, and uh, he's the leader of the Human Robot Interfaces and Physical Interaction Laboratory. Uh, he received his PhD degree in robotics and automation from uh, University of Pisa uh, in 2014. And he received his uh, ERC starting grant uh, in 2019. Uh, he's the coordinator and co-coordinator of a few uh, Horizon 2020 projects like uh, Sophia and uh, Concert. He also coordinates the uh, artificial intelligence for manufacturing lab uh he's the recipient of many awards uh so if i want to go through all of them it would take uh perhaps a chunk of the presentation time uh so i think uh i can leave the stage for you now uh Arish, to uh, start the presentation uh yes please okay thank you very much good afternoon everyone um it's, it's, it's a big pleasure to be here, of course. Uh, thanks for um, being here and listening to my talk. Uh, I think the introduction was complete. Let me just share my screen. Um, if something goes wrong, let me know. So um, I will give a talk about um, what are the key ingredients to, to create a personalizable human robot collaboration. So this talk will be interesting for not only robotics scientists, but also people working on human modeling and also some some people working on uh, interfacing humans and robots together. I will try to give an overview of different technologies. I try to uh, reduce the, the amount of uh, technical aspects, but uh, provide links to papers. So if you're interested in knowing more, please um, take a picture or have a note of the papers or please write me after the presentation. I will give you more details about that. Um, uh, just to give you a, a little bit more information about the lab. We are a group of uh, international, relatively young people, of course, and um, um, the, the group is slightly larger than what, what appears in the picture, and uh, we are working on different topics that I will give you some, some, some information about in, in a bit. Uh, as it was mentioned, we are active in several European and national projects, such as the ERC, SOFIA, which most of the works that I am uh, uh, I will be presenting is, um, is, is centered around this project. And we also received some funding from Amazon and, and Inail Italian uh, insurance, let's say, organization uh, for um, part of our research. I am actually currently coordinating two other labs. Um, one is uh, together with Leonardo Company, which is a new lab. You will probably hear more about this. It's called AI for Manufacturing. And a new joint lab starting uh, started recently. And we would like to bring uh, some of these technologies that I will show you to a higher technology readiness level so they can be exploited in, in, in industry and hopefully Europe. To give you an, uh, a brief, brief overview of what we are doing, um, so our research pillars are mostly um, divided in three. Uh, we, we do uh, want to know how humans um, interact with the, with the external world and we want to monitor their interactions and understand how uh, in, interaction basically change the, the ergonomics of the people, um, especially in industrial applications. We do work on autonomous and teleoperated robots that we will see a few slides there and also in, in terms of shared effort control and shared allocation control. I will talk mostly about uh, collaborative aspects and a little bit about autonomous and human ergonomics. Of course, um, more um, presentations that will be available if you would be interested, if we can organize some, some uh, direct uh, meetings and we can go through some details of our works. Just to give you an overview of how collaborative robots have been um, evolved over the past years, um, you know it's a famous story that we, we say, okay, we, we wanted to bring these robots closer to the, to the people. And what we did was uh, we just reduced the size of their cages, right? In the end, what we um, we are not exploiting their full potential because the, the the image you see at the bottom left is essentially it's larger, it's smaller scale is happening in the industry. So the robots are not essentially basically interacting with people. When we want to create the interaction between humans and robots, we are so worried about human safety. Of course, this is this is uh, a very important aspect, but probably um, this is not 
the right way when two people basically collaborate. When when I am working on some some industrial task and my colleague steps in in the, in the room, uh, I am not basically having this behavior. So I might be careful about my actions, but of course I would like to um, respond uh, reactively to do some collaboration with uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the person that he approaches. So um, here I would like to talk about a little bit what we can do to basically resolve this issue and create yeah, a socio-physical human body interaction uh, in, in various applications, in particular in industry. So going through the ingredients, I think one of the largest, um, one of the most important questions that we need to answer is, um, now we have, we are creating teams of humans and robots working together, right? So what would be the right way of uh, understanding how we can allocate uh, the tasks between these, these agents? We've been working a lot on this uh, topic over the past three years. Um, I will just go present one of the work we have done here. So what we did was uh, we tried to understand um, if we can divide uh, a high level task into smaller actions, we call them atomic actions. For instance, you can consider an assembly that is divided in several components and you can, you can actually divide it um, to various actions. This can be transportation, rotation, force insertion, and, and different ways of basically different atomic actions describing the task. And eventually, um, based on these atomic actions, we can create a context aware, let's say, um, evaluation criteria to understand how these tasks can be associated uh, to, to the agents. For instance, we can talk about task complexity, if the task is too complex for the robot to achieve it, or the dexterity of the agents involved between two people, between the robots and humans and robots involved, and also the effort to perform the task. And eventually, based on this, we can we can allocate the the task to the to the right agents. For task complexity, of course, there are several methods. We are also uh, providing some details here. On the dexterity levels, we can look into the workspace, the, the ability to create forces in 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 workspace or in certain let's say task space um, by the agents involved. It can be robots of multiple degrees of freedom. Of course, it's not about not only about finding the right agent, it's not about uh, who can do this, but it's also about who can do this with the minimum requirement. You cannot, probably we don't need to use a humanoid robot to do a six degree of freedom task, right? So this would be an overkill, just like that we don't use a two degree of freedom to do a six degree of freedom uh, task. We're also looking at agent effort by, by monitoring your fatigues and different, uh, let's say, indexes that, um, for instance, uh, how the variation of torques in the joints are evolving that I will present some slides later on. So if we integrate all these aspects together, a result of this type comes out. Um, the, the tasks are allocated in such a way that the, the large movement and heavier tasks are associated to the, are, are given to the robot, as we can see here. But the tasks that require more dexterity, for instance, the simple tasks of um, putting in small pieces and assembling small pieces that are really hard to automate or are very expensive to automate are associated, are given and allocated to the, to, the, to the human. So here you will see that the robot is moving um, large objects but at the same time to be able to create a good communication channel between them. You can see here we are using the augmented reality interface by providing basically some safety level. If the robot is approaching with sharp, uh, let's say levels, you would so basically a red, point saying that I am approaching to you with a sharp level. When it goes to a yellow, it's basically waiting for some response from the uh, co-worker. And when it's basically green, it means that um, it's, it, the robot is performing uh, its job with, with uh, not many risks applied, uh, applied to, the, to the human co-worker. So eventually you can see here that at some parts also the robot and human can collaborate based on the fourth uh, exchange information and the task can be done. Uh, can be done. So oh, in this direction, we have done a lot of works. We are recently looking into behavior trees and, and different, let's say, more dynamic and real-time task allocation techniques that if you would be interested, of course, I will provide some more details uh, eventually on that. Um, this, the, the, the second really important ingredient in creating um, socio-physical human-robot interaction is to create truly collaborative systems, which means that robots must be fully autonomous and and enable arbitrary interactions by the, by the people. So um, to give you an example, this is one of the recent works we have done. Uh, it's, it's, it relies on some observations on, uh, of the humans doing the box feeding task, right? This is a very 
let's say, a classical task that we usually do in, in former industry. But what we need is to improve its flexibility to the changes of the task and changes of the environment. So um, in this work, what we did by relying on uh, a occupancy grid, grid map that we received this information from the from the cameras from the top, we were able to detect the box sizes and knowing the items, of course, uh, the, the, the robot continues to fill in the box. But by truly collaborative, what I mean is that it provides, let's say, the flexibility to the human to intervene if required. You can see here that the, the occupancy map is adapted in real time um, and always around basically the, the changes of the environment, the robot um, planning is, is, is repeated in every, let's say, uh, step to, to provide the most optimal response. You can see here the, the placement of the box was changed. The, the number of basically components in the box is always keeps changing and the robot is always responding to these, these changes. Another experiment we did was to place these uh, randomly uh, random objects, randomly placed objects in the box, and through the same technique, you can see that the robot is able to detect them, to replace them, um, and place them in the, in the right, uh, let's say, position. And I will tell you a little bit more about how we, we do this placement. So the trick here is, um, of course, perception data might be subject to some uncertainty, but what we are doing, we're exploiting the, the constraints of the environment. So if you even blindfold, like close your eyes, you can, you can find the edge because you can surf in the environment and find the forces across the edges uh, of, the, of the desk and, and perform this, basically, basically um, item, item sorting. So we um, created some sort of um, interaction autonomy in our robot. We call it self-human impedance control in this work. Um, and the first rule of this um, controller is to always be compliant because compliance is really, really good uh, because it, uh, it is always safe and it always complies with the disturbances, right? That's why we call it compliant behavior. But of course, if you're always compliant, you cannot create forces. To be able to create forces, you need to first know if you are supposed to create forces. Therefore, based on the interaction expectancy, expectancy that comes from a it's a perception system. We can tune the impedance of the of the system through some formulation in the desired direction, and we can actually perform. Um, you could see, for instance, if you want to move in certain directions, you can be stiff in those directions and be compliant in the rest of the directions to, to basically respond to the disturbances in a way that you are um, not creating unnecessarily high interaction forces in constrained directions. It's very similar to opening a door. When you open the door, you basically uh, are usually only stiff or you apply forces only in the direction of the opening, even if you don't have a good model of the basically uh, a door, you're always basically following the, the right path, relying on the constraints given by the environment. Here, some, some um, data providing that uh, how this, this sort of type of impedance control helps us to perform the, the basically um, um, item sorting. So this is this what I was mentioning. If you're um, relying on um, stiff robot or industrial traditional robots that to, to perform big and whole tasks like assembly tasks, if you're stiff in this direction, you will see that um, the, the constraints provided by the environment, uh, if you also have some uncertainty in the vision, um, will create high interaction forces. But if you are able to, um, let's say, be compliant in the directions that you're not interact, you're not uh, applying, you're not providing any trajectories, you can comply and perform the task without um, creating unnecessarily high interaction forces. So um, another work, what, what concerns about creating two collaborative systems, what we, what we looked into was, of course, uh, the extension of uh, this work in somehow logistics applications, where we uh, thought of a system where um, we can, um, robotic system that can maximize the placement of the boxes on a pallet. Imagine um, your task will be uh, to put some boxes on a pallet of uh, known geometry. Of course, there are some several optimization techniques that they will tell you how you can place the boxes that you can maximize their number. Then we included some ergonomics factors here, for instance, saying that if small boxes or lightweight um, boxes exist, human can, can uh, contribute to the execution of the task. But for larger or heavier boxes, it is important that the robot performs that so it doesn't provide, it doesn't uh, create any risks to, to, the, to the operators. 
So um, in this particular example, what you see here, a robot through the camera is scanning the Aruco markers here, and it basically gets some information about the, the weight of these boxes. And then it runs an optimization that you could see earlier here that tells the, the robot what are the most um, efficient placement of the boxes on this pallet with the known size through the camera, of course, always, that you can maximize the number of the boxes. But of course, each box is um, uh, tagged with some economic score and the human par partner can contribute to the ones that uh, are healthier for him or her to, to, to carry. When it comes to larger boxes, um, due to the limitations of the, of the gripper or the weight, which creates some torque, probably it was not possible to create, uh, uh, let's say, a, a single robot movement and to create this collaborative system that the human and robot can, can basically uh, together perform this, this uh, collaborative function in such a way that the load is shared between human and the robot and the placement of the box is always optimal because there's always a graphical user interface that provides feedback to the user. And this is known by the We run this experiment on several subjects and um, both in terms of, let's say, um, loading, physical loading and also cognitive loading. When the number of boxes are increasing, then the placement of the boxes on a pallet becomes a bit intricate because you keep changing the position of the box to understand uh, how you can uh, maximize those numbers. But, uh, people tend to like this. Of course, there's a lot of work to be done to make it uh, more intuitive for the user. When it comes to collaborative systems, of course, one very important question to answer is how we can distinguish sources of interaction. So a very quick example here would be a robot dealing with a, with a payload. For instance, you have gravitational load, uh, which applies uh, when the robot is holding a piece, uh, a tool, or anything that you have. Uh, sorry, this, could, this should be FO, if uh, this is for this uh, by the object. And there is this human applying some forces, right? That's like, um, this can be the F human when you want to manipulate or basically give some comments. In some recent work, we did this by um, basically creating a um, hybrid, hybrid controller, which has impedance and admittance loop in, the, in, in its control framework. And you can see the, the, the response to the forces applied at the tool level are all in for impedance, helping that the robot to comply with the constraints and basically environmental uncertainties. But nevertheless, the robot permits the, the operator to move the robot in any direction that you want. For instance, you, if you're supposed to correct robot movement, you can call some collaborative task, this would be possible. As a use case, we did the collaborative screwing. So what happened here through the open pose of the, uh, by applying 3D, let's say, a construction of the human movement, also the fingers, we could understand where the person is placing the screws on the table. And through body gesture recognition, the robot was activating uh, a movement. So the place, the person was placing the screws on the table. It was detected automatically and the robot was performing screwing action. It was always possible for the, for the person to move the um, robot around in case of, let's say, errors or, uh, let's say, possible interactions that were not be required. Also, in terms of uh, screwing, we, we have a new adaptive controller that you can see it understands when, when uh, the screwing is, is finalized and, and basically it, uh, it does not create high forces which are unnecessary to. Moving forward after the true collaborative uh, control systems, um, one really important aspect that my team is working on, especially in the ERC uh, project, is to understand human ergonomics and to understand how we can use these systems to, to make sure that the people perform their tasks in the most, uh, let's say, comfortable and ergonomic way. If you are reviewing the state of the art and in monitoring humans in general or understanding human ergonomics, on the very industrial side, let's say here on the left side, we have, um, we call them pen and paper based because they are very um, heuristic and then there are some, uh, let's say, um, very general and rough rules about uh, how human movement should look like. And uh, they are not generalizable, of course, and these systems are very static and uh, you can barely apply them to interactive tasks because they do not consider mm -hmm. the varying uh, interaction between the human and the, and the environment. On the right side, we have these very fancy, of course, um, uh, 
uh, offline models um, that you know a lot of them for instance, anybody and these kind of systems that provide a very detailed, uh, very good measure of the, let's say, muscle forces and joint torques and, and things like that, but they are very computationally costly and their personalization is really difficult because we have thousands of parameters in these systems that uh, personalizing them will be really difficult. Um, in my team, and especially in IIT, we have a good knowledge of humanoid uh, robotics, and we believe that those tools that can be can be scalable easily, that can be um, implemented in real time, are good techniques, of course, to, to to bridge this gap, right? So maybe we can use those techniques to be able to to um, create online modular and scalable, of course, systems with the, with the possibility to personalize them. We started with the with the with the with model the center of mass of the system. Uh, of course, this contains a lot of good information. This can give us the center of pressure and from the center of pressure, we can go um, we can go to the joint level and understand uh, how interaction, interaction, external interaction applied to the human um, affect the, let's say, body torques. So relying on the statistically equivalent, uh, equivalent serial chain model, um, we, we, uh, we ran some experiments, of course, I will show you a little bit more details later on, to be able to identify those parameters in for each person. You can see here, um, we had a very good uh, precision to understand uh, where the center of mass of the, of the subjects are. And this information is used, of course, um, together with the dynamics of the interaction, which we know, uh, it's, it, 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 these are, this is the floating base formulation that basically collects all the um, gravitational, Coriolean, basically acceleration, inertia forces, and there are the joint torques, and of course the external forces applied to the, the ground or basically through the hands. So um, we, we made a trick here, which made our life, uh, lives way more easier. So if you basically um, do not have any interaction between uh, the human and the external world, you will have uh, this formula, which is the, the arrangement of this, but when you start interacting with the external world, of course, the, the center of pressure displaces and the ground reaction forces change, but nevertheless, the, these parameters remain constant. Right? So if you subtract these parameters, it means that you only need the, the hand Jacobian the interaction forces and also the center of pressure Jacobians to be able to understand how much torque is applied to the human body. So you don't need to met inertia, Coriolis, or neither the gravitational forces. That makes um, this um, it applies, it, it, it triggers a very good simpli simplification in understanding these aspects. Um, you can see here, my colleague is, is, is holding three and five kilogram, um, let's say payload, and you can see how the loading pin is between elbow, shoulder, uh, hip, or knee and ankle. So this is really nice, but of course we need to make it in real time. In one of the recent works, what we did uh, using some techniques in, together with the Kalman filtering, we made everything in real time. So here, Luca is following some suggested poses, which minimizes the number of poses that are required to identify that model parameters. And uh, if you closely uh, follow these, these models and record all the data, we are able to identify the model that I was mentioning to you in real time. When the model is identified, so it, it is really uh, nice because we can uh, monitor in real time the overloading joint torques, the torques that are at the, at the body joints, and we can tell the person how much uh, loading is applied to the shoulder and different articulations. You can see here, in certain configurations, the loading on the shoulder is, is high and it might uh, be risky for people performing their these jobs in any way. Um, so this was one step. In the in the second step, what we did was um, trying to understand. Of course, not always the interaction happens between the hand and the external world. We were trying to understand if relying on the equilibrium theory, we can understand where the point of contact is. So here it happens to be at the at the hand, um, but we don't know this. So by by knowing the human model and reading the ground reaction forces, we understand where the point of contact is, and then um, monitor the ground the overloading joint of the of the person. So to to show you, this system works for uh, different contact, uh, let's say different contact uh, locations here. 
my colleague is, is, is building this, this system with the forearm and the system in real time is able to, to detect where the point of contact is. And again, all the overloading joints are estimated based on the point of contact. So really the good news is this model can be first used as a visual feedback. So you could see in the video and also in this example, uh, if the situation of working is, is, is not um, basically um, pleasant for the workers, we can provide them some feedback and they can, can take their postures and make it more healthier and more economic. This was quite promising and we said we, we thought maybe it's not easy to put screens everywhere. If the people are working within a very, let's say, cluttered space, maybe putting screens or um, augmented reality systems are not really uh, possible. So we thought of maybe also designing a viral tactile feedback is, uh, that is basically very small, uh, wireless, um, vibration-based uh, tool that we put them on, on joints of the people and based on the overloading joints, we provide them some feedback. Uh, obviously, we ran some experiments to understand if the system is um, performing well, and we, we, we saw that after providing this type of feedback, people um, showed better, let's say, change of the torque and muscular activity patterns in performing some tasks, and it suggested that it is guiding the, the users of this technology towards uh, uh, performing tasks in, in more healthier conditions, which means that the loading effect of this box of uh, 5.7 kilogram in different pick and place task was, was minimized. For instance, uh, activity in, uh, by the upper arm was by it's about 50% and uh, the, the variation was quite, quite, uh, quite nice. Another really nice application of these models, of course, is the human robot collaboration. What, what it means, if you, if you know what is the state of the person collaborating with the robot, we can actually change the trajectory and make the person knowing all the constraints coming from the tasks and the balance, et cetera, et cetera, how they can collaborate in, in a way that the, the, the working person is improved. So we put this in an optimization formulation. Remember the overloading joint works. And of course, what we, what we wanted to do to minimize the overloading joint works with the, with the weighting factor in the middle by giving some priority to certain joints. Of course, it's if, for instance, shoulder or ankle crosses a, a, a threshold, we can, we can increase the, the gain for that and putting this optimization and not some stacking some constraints, the robot can actually change the, the um, the posture of the person toward minimizing the forks of the joints that are subject to risks. Uh, an early demonstration of this was done in Tech Innovation Award of 2018, where we won the challenge. Um, so here, instead of Xsense, we measured human uh, kinematics using the 3D skeleton that you can see here. And the overloading joint talks were measured. And through the optimization, you can see here the robot knows where the configuration can be to minimize the loading effect of this 2.5 kilogram drill. Uh, but of course, on top of that, we ran, we added some uh, intelligence where we could track the human movements and the robot was always responding reactively and ergonomically to the state of the person when the person was doing this. And this scaled uh, up to uh, different tasks. For instance, the person was holding a polish, the robot was the, the vision system was detecting it's a polisher and it was providing the, the right tool, the right object to the person. So of course, this is just a demonstration and we were not doing the real task. Uh, and uh, everything was continuing again to provide some uh, uh, better working conditions for this for this person. In, in the previous slides, in, I was talking about the instant loading, but of course, many tasks in the industry uh, are um, repetitive of uh, lightweight nature. Here, um, a person is, for instance, performing a hypothetical painting task. It's light, but it's repetitive. And we started looking into how the overloading fatigue uh, is developing. And when the fatigue is, was reaching a certain level, the robot was optimizing the configuration of the, of the, of the task and bringing to a more situation. Um, this was, um, this is a whole body, let's say, model. And then if, if, if this happens to be at the ankle or hip level, of course, it works the same. You can see here the fatigue is starting to increase um, in these joints and the robot helps them to perform it in the, the right way. So this, what we did here is, of course, the robot can always change and perform, give you the best configuration, but, but that would be really awkward because 
maybe the person wants to move around and, and do really quick painting tasks. So here the robot was waiting uh, to understand if the person wants to focus more in that area to, to perform. More on the ergonomic side, after um, designing an, uh, our collaborative uh, robot assistant that we call it MOCA, we extended these models to multi-person. Multi uh, here, for instance, uh, our MOCA was, after perceiving the first person, was performing an ergonomic handover task to receive an object. And then um, after receiving that, when uh, the second person was appearing, uh, and we detect the tool, the robot was doing another sort of optimization, not only by minimizing the overloading joint work, but also um, was um, providing a, a better working condition for the force manipulability. So in the optimization of this, um, sorry, there's a phone ringing, maybe. I don't know if you hear it, but uh, it's from my colleague from sorry, it's a, it's a uh, We are here also optimizing for the force. The extension of this was done in uh, in, uh, in another scenario where, of course, the uh, not only the collaborative people but also the coexistent partners exist. Let me just fix this one, one second time. <laughs> Sorry about that. So, and here, of course, you saw um, you integrated some sort of obstacle avoidance dynamic obstacles that are people that are not, uh, not working with the, with the people uh, and static obstacle avoidance to, to promote uh, basically this type of interest. The fourth ingredient I would like to talk about is um, the interface level, of course, not only in terms of software, but also in terms of hardware. It would be really interesting to develop. Uh, intuitive and ergonomic interfaces that um, promote and facilitate the interaction between humans and robots. In this direction, we've been looking into passive systems like uh, supernumerary arms that they not only um, reduce the loading effect, for instance, here through this passive system, we are able to, um, let's say, uh, compensate for a certain payload. Of course, it means it is passive, it means that the payload will be fixed from the beginning. But we are also through the design of this damping system, we are able to isolate the vibrations. So the vibrations are not also transferred to the person. And this, this is um, let's say a very good, uh, let's say, result for, for the workers that uh, with one system, we are, we are sort of um, minimizing two issues that are um, coming up. Uh, when it comes to active systems, of course, um, uh, everybody knows um, Active skeletons are extremely important. They're extremely, let's say, they have a large, large potential, especially in, in medical applications. But also in industry, they have shown that there's a there's a good, let's say, potential. But the only thing is, um, to create high payloads, we usually end up uh, with the very large systems with the people inside them. This looks very, very easy. If you look at the face of this person, probably there's a lot of uh, cognitive load involved. And, uh, is, uh, having these systems to uh, eight hours a day for, for weeks and months is not going to be easy. So to confront this, we created this uh, simplistic but very effective system. And we created this uh, whole body interface that by using the uh, uh, weighted uh, let's say whole body mobility controller between the arm and the base, you can move the system very simply, uh, take the 10 kilogram object, without changing the pattern of locomotion, without any variability constraint. So basically, you can perform these kind of tasks. Um, a, a more a, a elegant version of this would be using a, a more, let's say, intelligent um, interface that through the gestures, you can, you can uh, perform more actions. Here, the, anytime you need the robot, you can, you can call the robot, the robot, the robot approaches to you. And through some gestures, you can change the locomotion pattern, uh, the mobility pattern from whole body um, local manipulation to locomotion, local manipulation to auto manipulation, of course. Mm -hmm. And you can actually perform this kind of task. So my colleague wants to uh, moving the box to different uh, after the uh, the task. 
task is being accomplished because patch very simple and when it comes to interfaces of course uh, we also work on um, other types of intelligent systems but uh, we want to blend the visual and haptic information that we receive from the robot and I'm not going to details but the, the, the short story there is this one so anytime the human would like to uh, guide the robot through the touch or throughout the application of the forces the robot becomes uh, similar to what you saw in the previous slide you can hold the robot and move it around but when there is no um, haptic information the robot basically follows you by tracking you so here the robot basically tracks you and comes uh, close to you and then you can actually you have two ways of uh, moving the robot you can hold it you can move it around very simply you can uh, arrive to a task and by simply clicking the robot loads this in this box on its back it, maybe it's, of course it can be as as heavy as the payload of the arm, but here, of course, you know that Frank Bai is about three kilograms, but it was just a proof of concept in the first. But eventually, what you what you have is uh, again, if you could, you, if you want, you can still um, have to get information. Uh, you can move the robot by touch, or just basically continue moving, and robot will avoid the obstacles and will keep uh, following you in the, in the directions that you will. So we thought maybe this system would be really helpful. In different applications, including logistics, uh, etc. If you think of uh, projects or applications that you would like to apply this here, more. the last part I would like to talk about is, of course, um, not only on the physical aspects but also on the cognitive ergonomics and load monitoring. This is a, a new and ongoing work. Uh, what we're doing is, um, as you know, in the state of the art, is uh, to apply. Um, Eye tracking systems or EEG systems or basically galvanic skin response or heart rate measures to understand if the, if the load, cognitive load or stress levels of the people are increasing. This works perfectly well in isolated spaces or when we are sitting behind our desks, but this is not going to be very functional in industry with a lot of noise, with a lot of, let's say, um, disturbances. So we thought of maybe looking at the patterns of, of human let's say, uh, movements, especially by tracking their body and by knowing uh, if there's something wrong, of course, there's a lot of good literature about, uh, let me give you an example. If, if, if people keep touching their faces, this has some significant, this has some meaning. If people have some body postures, uh, you know, um, it's very simple to understand if one of your colleagues enters the lab through the, by looking at this person, you can know that if the person is relaxed or is under stress. So we're trying to capture that only by using the camera. And this is extended to several, um, let's say, screens that you can follow the instructions and not only by, by uh, let's say, by looking if the, person, the person's attention is toward instructions, task or somewhere else. For instance, if, if, if you're not, not looking at the instructions, instructions here not looking at the assembly and you're looking at the sky for instance and for a longer period of time you're doing this it means that you probably um, are concerned or you're distracted or things like that so we are trying to capture this and also the body the body movements and things like that we're looking into that and hopefully this will uh, this will bring us to some really good results obviously we are comparing all these measurements with uh, with the traditional techniques such as galvanic skin response heart rate measures etc etc to see if you can see some 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 patterns and uh, and that's pretty much it sorry it wasn't the last one so the last one is um robot autonomy i don't know how much time i have i think about four minutes right wait uh yeah uh normally uh up to 4 45. okay uh, I'll I'll try to andre is okay as well yeah but yes so as I was mentioning, we're working um, on pure robot autonomy. So to give you some ideas, um, this is uh, the, the, a controller we developed to, to uh, blindfoldedly make robots to do assembly tasks by uh, some sort of adaptive controller. Here you can obviously see there is a misalignment between the, the two assembly parts, but by knowing the force information, the, the robot basically can perform this, this this type of assembly and of course you know that this is not easy with an active system 
the, the passive um, do other version of this would be the remote center compliance but of course we try to to to, to make this happen with, a, with an active system if you're interested to know more please have a read the paper finally for the best paper one we are working also on uh, a way different technique uh, this is a collaboration with ucl and uh, the guys of UCL um, provided us with some really good perception data, understanding and distinguishing the type of rubbish that might, you might encounter in, in the streets or basically in shopping centers or stuff like that. So what we um, what we did by, by using a network to understand what the, the type of garbage is and understanding the coordinates of this garbage, the system was autonomously moving and navigating around and, uh, and uh, distinguishing them, and let's say, Creating a very intelligent garbage disposal system. So here you can see that the, the system tells the robot that this is a drinking can, and the robot, knowing the coordinates, takes it and, and and throws it in the right bin. And this happens also for the for this one. Like this is a, it's a carton, and it takes it and all the way to. This is an ongoing work. Again, we are very interested in, in, um, in moving in this direction because, as you know, there's a lot of um, focus and attention towards creating sustainable systems and uh, my dream is to have these systems running around of course not we are not ready for having them in the street but maybe in some some, uh, some way more protected areas like uh, industrial affairs it can be um the last very video that i would like to show is also the use of our system in um, uh, manipulating uh, under let's say um, Underactuated systems, for instance, a pallet jack that has only two degrees of freedom, one translation or one rotation mode, and the robot by detecting the handle through vision and uh, fusing the forces and uh, building a bicycle model of this, it can optimize for the trajectories of the, of the system and perform this. Of course, it's fully autonomous, it's not rotated, uh, and uh, displace this pallet, uh, pallet jack from one position to a desired position. I think. This can be also very interesting um, a theory that applied to to mobile robots that can can uh, work in the industrial workplaces to to move system grammar. Uh, there are systems that aut are automated, but they're about 40, 50,000 euros. But uh, in small companies, they're usually used um, one percent of the time, so this can save a lot of time. This brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for listening, uh, acknowledging us again the projects and, and the funding. If there are any questions, I'd be really happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Arash, for the very nice presentation.